All right, so I've got the green light. Um, I want to get started right on time since I don't want to be responsible for delaying anybody else later. I'm Andre Kuzniarek, Director of Document and Media Systems at Wolfram Research. And this is going to be a little show and tell uh, on the uh, courseware tools uh, package that uh, we're developing that Stephen gave a brief uh, sneak peek at in his keynote. And what we're talking about is a, a tool set to uh, essentially um, streamline the process of putting together uh, content that will be video recorded or, well, video captured um, off of your computer screen while uh, narrating uh, or, or speaking to uh, the concepts involved. Uh, in order to essentially be able to put together uh, short pieces or, you know, however long you want, but essentially uh, video lectures uh, of, the, of the style you might see on Khan Academy or any number of other MOOCs, except um, the, uh, the driving force behind this is more about um, the uh, Wolfram language being uh, exposed to the viewer while the overall concept of uh, whatever uh, special area, uh, whatever content area is being focused on by the lecture. Um, it, and in a sense, that's kind of our special sauce. Um, a lot of the, the MOOCs out there, massive online open courses that are based on video lectures, uh, tend to focus on capturing the viewer's attention with hand gestures, uh, hand drawing, diagramming live on the screen. Udacity uses a pretty cool technique of, of using overlays where the, what's being drawn by the instructor uh, is essentially rendered as an interactive uh, potential interface for quizzing or uh, you know, over, uh, overlaid over any other video content that's being presented. Um, in, in the case of what we're putting together here, the, the, the thought is that um, the Wolfram language itself um, as a knowledge-based language is something that uh, is, is great for presenting all kinds of different uh, con uh, concepts in the STEM fields. Uh, and as a programming language is very verbose, it's, it's, very, it's a natural language style of programming language with all the functions being declared uh, as words. And so it, it's really quite possible to, uh, to almost ignore that it's there, but have it be the thing that is, is visualizing uh, the concepts and the points that uh, you want to have made. The idea of this package is uh, to carry all the way into our cloud framework. Uh, it hasn't, we haven't connected it to that yet, but as you saw from what Stephen was demoing in the keynote, uh, whatever begins its life on the desktop can very easily migrate to the cloud with a few button pushes. The idea is that you know, our, our usability will be so streamlined that the, the potential here is to create your lecture, uh, do the video recording of it, uh, push a few buttons, uh, deploy it to the cloud, and have something that is uh, viewable by uh, your future students and something that you can interact with in the, in the cloud environment. Um, so let, let's go ahead and take a look at, at how this uh, particular thing is working. Uh, I'll essentially demo it in a little more detail than what you saw earlier today. Um, so I'm running Mathematica right now, and uh, in our palettes menu, when, when you first load uh, the package, or if given a, um, a simple little notebook that is a palette uh, that you could send to somebody an email, uh, you, would get, uh, you would open that little palette, which is this installer here. Um, this is uh, referencing our internal packlet server right now. But the idea is that this tool kit uh, will be published on our public packlet system, and yet we'll probably be getting revised on a regular basis. Uh, so the idea here is you, you push the install button, 
And it's checking right now to see if anything is already installed as far as the packlet goes. Uh, this is written to check for an actual uh, package that is the, the more traditional package. It's not a packlet implementation. Uh, and we'll, we'll give you instruction based on that as well. So I've got the one that's uh, already, in, uh, it's already been installed here as a packlet. It's the latest. And it's not installing it again, but it has loaded the package for me now. Uh, having done so, it's now updated my uh, menus. And under the new menu, I have uh, a new item added at the bottom of this list uh, called lecture. So it's giving me uh, a template uh, to work with. And so everything starts from this. This is the source notebook of what uh, gets deployed from it. And currently at this stage, uh, where we are is having mostly completed uh, the process of, of capturing the, the, the script, uh, all the inputs, uh, and a control palette, a control system for running those while you're doing your uh, reading of the script and, and video capture. Um, so uh, there's a, a doc cell at the top here uh, that uh, offers a number of interface aspects of working with this notebook, but uh, the template is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have metadata at the top here uh, and uh, you know room for putting in a, a graphic that Stephen exploited for his self-portrait that uh, he, he likes to joke about a little bit because it, it tends to make him look 30 years younger. Um, but uh, you can put anything you want there. Uh, that's what your, your presentation opens with. And then you have a series of, of text and, and input uh, sessions, uh, inputs that, are, uh, that include uh, metadata labels so that when the inputs are extracted into a workbook, uh, you can keep descriptions in line with them without necessarily associating a narrative uh, uh, script to go with them. Um, uh, insertions would be, you know, another input template uh, to, to, you know, uh, evaluate something with the metadata in place to change. Um, but uh, you might be uh, inserting a note to yourself of how you want to phrase something or an action you're going to do while you're reading the script. Uh, and then there's numerous other kinds of insertions like uh, a quiz uh, where you would mark the answer here and then when the video uh, processing occurs, when, when you're actually going to record the thing, it, it appears in the sequence of where you've put it in your script and it's displayed on the screen to be recorded. Uh, something called a think point is just uh, uh, a case of uh, inserting something to uh, just, you know, stop and, and take notice of something that was being presented. Uh, and then, uh, I'm not going to go into it right now, but uh, I'll see if time allows, a camera input. So I've got a webcam on here, but uh, your computer, like Stephen demonstrated this morning, may have a separate camera that's inserted in your USB input to record something on your desk. So if you have physical objects you want to show, a diagram you want to write out, you insert a template for camera input. When your script gets to that point, it will swap screens and switch to the, the camera input going straight into Mathematica, and that's part of the video that you're recording. You don't have to think about it. It just happens. You take care of whatever you want to show and then step out of it again. Uh, you could be inserting a slide that is a, a pure image, uh, and I, I don't really want to navigate for something right now, but if I insert this template, uh, then I have a placeholder here, and, and I can always go back and navigate and edit for something that uh, will take over your screen and just become a picture instead of input and output. Um, and uh, similarly with web browsers, uh, you might want to insert a template to go load a particular URL, uh, which you would just again type into this placeholder here, uh, or you might really just want to tell uh, your system to, uh, to uh, open a particular browser that you can choose from a list. Um, so, in, and that's perhaps because you've already got a page loaded, you've perhaps scrolled to a point where you want to be where maybe there's no anchor for it or something, uh, and you just want to switch to that view while you're in your recording process. All of these things, once entered into your script, are then 
uh, built into the process of simply stepping through while you're talking, while you're reading your script and recording what happens so that uh, you don't have to think about switching for yourself. You know, it, it's to try and automate as much as possible up front. Um, so uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, I didn't really insert a lot of these things, so I don't necessarily want to run through them, but, but let me just show uh, when you have uh, uh, a lecture that's about ready to, uh, to work with, um, you would run, as Stephen had showed, this generate recording configuration. So it, it's done that right now in the case of this very simple little example, and I'll pull up his lecture to show how that one went. Um, and, and what's been generated here is a, a script that is paged. Uh, so the idea there is that you know you, you don't want to lose one of your hands or controls to be scrolling through a notebook. A script is best read like a slideshow. It, you page through it. Um, and so when you're reading, um, uh, you reach a point at the end of the page. It gives you either a marker to show you that you're coming to the next page, and then it'll flip pages for you. Um, the record window would be uh, this here. And it's equally possible uh, that you, you want to move this around. I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate in a second, if I have a little time, of how you can position this to always then appear in exactly the same place on screen. And the goal is that uh, you, you don't have to think about it again if you set up your capture system to focus on it. So we tend to use Camtasia as the recording software in-house. And you would set up a custom uh, uh, record window that captures only the content area of this window. Uh, and once it's locked into that, all the lectures that you produce will always be opened up in that space. You go to Camtasia, say grab your custom window, start record, and you're ready to record whatever is going to be played in that space. And like I mentioned, that space might switch out to your web browser. You position your web browser where you want it to be so that that capture area is capturing what you want to show on your web browser. So then the idea is to have a control palette like this, which is a little bit too big to use because it's obscuring everything. I have a smaller one I'll, I'll run with. Uh, but the point of this originally was that Stephen envisioned uh, having access to all kinds of controls for what you want to run through this lecture uh, on, his, uh, on an iPad. Uh, there's an application called Air Display that lets you extend your desktop to your iPad and, and, and also allows the touch sensitivity of the iPad to work. So this palette can live on an iPad, you know, wherever you want it, as an extension of your desktop. You touch the buttons on the iPad and they will run whatever is in Mathematica like any other palette would. So, uh, and there are, are complications to that I'll just mention in a moment here. But, but so the idea is, uh, let, let me get rid of this large palette and open a smaller version of it. Yay, so it doesn't obscure too much now. Um, so we have a button that initially does the transition from your opening graphic uh, to uh, the, the notebook that's going to uh, contain all of your inputs and outputs. And you know, that's to exploit what was new in 9, which is in the slideshow mode, you can transition uh, from one slide to the next with a number of different transition effects. Um, then the idea is that uh, you do have this one button to push uh, that takes uh, your input stack from the lecture notebook and evaluates them starting over from a, a new input number in Mathematica. Another aspect of our special sauce is this usage layer. So uh, while we are, are running through a lecture talking about, in Stephen's case, data science, which I'll show in a minute, um, you can be learning about Mathematica because all of the, the inputs are potentially annotated with these usage messages, or they can be any type of annotation that you decide to track uh, in your source notebook. Um, the, the, the nice idea here is that uh, as a student, seeing this video, I can scrub through it at any time and go back and, and see what usages came up. I don't have to you know, worry too much about following along, but, but, but it's all there, and I'm learning the language while I'm hearing discussion about a topic that is not focusing on the language. I mean, it's not like Stephen is sitting here going, and in Mathematica, you type this, and you type that, and you have to use this, and this is how you use a, this particular syntax. You know, he elides all of that. 
Uh, he just gets to the point of what you want to be investigating, and this is all just kind of happening in the background. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's my last evaluation here, so it's telling me my recording is going to be done. Uh, so this is a very simple example, but l let's pull up uh, his particular notebook and, and uh, take a look at that just a little bit further. Uh, so uh, let's see if I have it in my recent stack here. Let's close this. Um, so uh, he's, you know, he's got a pretty substantial amount of content here. He's also using markers that you can put in. This is when I should hit the type button. This is when I should hit the, uh, the button again to evaluate. And again, as far as our script is coming together, uh, these can be buttons in the script. And so you could just, you know, if you didn't even want to look at what was being recorded, you can just look at your script and, and push buttons. Uh, ultimately, you know, it's one button that you push and it carries you all the way through. Um, so he's got all this content. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, demonstrating um, uh, using uh, our, our word dictionary as a way to explore uh, data science concepts for this first introductory lecture. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and pull everything out of that like you saw him do before. Um, Uh, well, those are they're markers currently, and, and you'll see them in the script to just be a reminder of when you're reading your script, when you should push the button to show the input, and then when you should push the button to evaluate the input. Uh, again, the point is to try and get this to the stage where uh, you can focus entirely on your performance of the script and keeping that script synced with what you're demonstrating uh, such that you you essentially... You can, you can make a recording uh, all in one pass, ideally, you know, without having to keep stepping through it and, oh, back up, I said that wrong, or, oh, wait, I didn't get this timed right, you know. Uh, these things can get messy and complicated. Uh, there's no avoiding the potential for errors, but uh, I'll show some things we have to deal with that. Um, I'll try to wrap up very quickly here. So uh, let me just go ahead and uh, reopen the... Uh, the small palette. Uh, actually, it's right here. Uh, so to just show how the script is looking, um, it, it fills the screen, uh, and then big blue button pages through it. Uh, there's a blue highlight at the bottom to indicate what's going to appear at the top. All of these inputs in gray are buttons that do the same thing this type button does. Um, so let's say if we were uh, if we had a bigger display to work with right now, you'd be running this and could be running in numerous places. Um, so uh, I advance to begin. I have my video capture taking place. I start reading the script uh, whenever I wanted to read it, uh, and I'm entering these inputs. Now, normally I would have uh, already evaluated my Word data packlets. So I wouldn't have to see that and work my way through. Um, one of the things we want to be able to highlight is uh, you know, being able to, oops, uh, I shouldn't have grabbed that, um, being able to call out things with a nice pointer. So again, this is in Mathematic. I'm switching the mouse pointer with a right click on my mouse. I've got this little tiny laser pointer sort of thing that I can't even see right now on my, on my display uh, that lets me know where it's going, and then I can flip to it again and then disappear out. Um, this is probably the most challenging aspect of what we would want to try to automate in the script, but I believe it's doable, and we're going to be working on that, so that you could put metadata in your script that says, I want to show this, and then I want to show that. And again, every time you push your button, it's just going to take care of that while the recording is going, and you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, so working your way through all of that eventually gets you to a finished recording, and let's take a quick look at uh, the recording Stephen made recently. Okay, well this is going to be a very hands-on course. So let's just get right down to some data science. And for this lecture, our data set is going to be words in the English language. Now he's, like the this ones is what he's reading from his script. And like lots of other while things, he's recording it. these are built-in data in the world from language. So here's how we can get a list of them. Here's the input, and here's the output. Let's compute how long this list is. About 150,000. And actually, we can see immediately that it's got more things in it than we want. 
not just ordinary words, but also numbers and multi-word combinations and things. So let's write a tiny bit of code to clean this up. Well, in this lecture, I'm just going to show code. You can play with it yourself in the workbook, and a bit like learning a human language by exposure, you'll gradually learn how to write this kind of code yourself. This code selects the entries in the list that only contain letters and not numbers or spaces, and then calls the result words. Okay, well, we could still argue about whether all of these are genuine words. So let's get to us. What about other visualizations? Here's one modeled on the typical way of showing tag clouds with the area of each letter indicating its frequency. And uh, here's the same thing with the letters sorted in order of frequency. Each of these visualizations brings out different aspects of our data, which is why it's usually good to try several different visualizations. Of course, not every visualization will immediately show something obviously useful. Like, let's plot the lengths of all successive individual words from our list that begin, let's say, with S. At first, this just looks pretty Let's and conjugations, con there are fewer in the exercises, but it's time to end the lengths for each part of speech. For things like noun, pronouns and conjugations, conjunctions rather, these are pretty ragged. But for nouns and verbs, for example, there are enough to give smooth distributions, and they're all definitely different. Well, there are lots of interesting things to study here, a fewer in the exercises, but it's time to end this lecture now. But I hope I've been able to give you at least a taste of what it's like to do data science. And I hope you'll join me for more data science in future lectures. Thank you. So that's one video out of a series of many he's planning for a data science course. And running all the way through, he's using Mathematica to illustrate what he's talking about, but he's not talking about Mathematica. Uh, and that's kind of how we see this working for anybody adopting it. Uh, now, quickly, uh, let me uh, show, if the, I, I think uh, Stephen probably showed pretty well the deployment in the cloud. I can show that again real fast. The idea here is that uh, you have a, a scalable framework here. Um, you could watch the video full size if you want, watch it smaller. This workbook is an extraction from that script of just the inputs uh, and outputs or conceivably just the inputs with the meta information about what the inputs are for the student to follow along. Uh, other details that are important for implementing this are being able to uh, uh, determine the position of a cell on screen in the notebook so that that usage that is following the input stays with the, use, uh, the input and not flying all over the place. Very tricky, very undocumented, uh, but it's a feature that's there and we're exploiting it. Uh, this notebook will be made available. Uh, cell size measurement. Uh, when I'm creating that uh, um, script and paging it, um, you know, Mathematica just doesn't have a way to access uh, page breaks from the front end. So you have to build your own pages by stacking up the cells, measuring them until they get to the point where you know it's the size of your document window, and that's when you create a new slide, because it's really just a slideshow going from one slide to the next. Um, it's just a while loop going through that. That's why it kind of takes long. I'm looking for a more efficient way to do that. Uh, but for now, um, you render a cell off screen through this packlet or, or this, this little bounding box size packet. Uh, and it, it's not the smartest thing if, if you're formatting your cells a certain way, you have to explicitly provide all those cell options for it to get the proper measurement of how it's rendered. Uh, word count um, is part of what gets extracted. When you look at the script, it tells you how many words, how long it should take you to read it. It's pretty accurate. Uh, and uh, we do that by, uh, you know, stripping out all the text uh, from uh, the, the notebook, leaving everything else out because uh, it's just uh, making, a, you know, the, the script out of text. Um, then I, I demonstrated the way the packlet-based delivery is working, and there's uh, a lot of interesting functionality in terms of pinging a packlet server and getting information about what packlets are installed on your system that also aren't documented, but uh, that is a great way to deploy stuff. Uh, and we're going to be exploiting that more and more. And then I mentioned uh, uh, Air Display, uh, which is a very cool little app 
uh, that uh, works well even with uh, an iPad, uh, the first iPad. So in fact, if, you, if you've moved on to like the latest iPad and your old one is kind of useless to you, this is a great way to extend it. Uh, I'm done. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll take a few real fast. Right here. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't even talked about that with Stephen, but I, I'm sure it's probably going to be free with uh, what we're doing with all our cloud stuff. You know. When? So. Ultimately, you get a Camtasia input file or some other video format that one could, if one chose to further edit. Correct. Well, well, it's whatever you choose to record it with. We're we're not currently at the point in Mathematica that it can do video recording to the degree that you have something worth editing afterwards. You know, uh, it, it will do a certain amount of video capture, but maybe in another two releases we'll have a video capture image processing editing all in Mathematica as well. Uh, I heard when being asked, uh, this implementation of it is very close to finished now, so uh, in the next month or two it'll probably be out. It should be part of the version 10 release coming down the road as well, um, if there are no other questions. Uh, it, it will work with nine, but uh, there are some potential hazards there that we're, we have to go back and double check if it'll work smoothly. Uh, what's that in the back? What about the uh, I, I haven't tried that yet. Of course, it's doable. Mathematica has that built in, and I could experiment with that, but it wasn't part of the consideration for this right now. Uh, well, if for content you already have, you would want to have to throw it into this template and pull it out from there if you want to use the workflow. So anyway, I better leave it at that. Thank you.